Yes, so uh, my topic is uh, data simulation in marine ecosystem models. And uh, I tried to keep the ecosystem model part quite basic. So for some of you, this will be uh, old news. And for some of you, it may be all new uh, information. So I have the lecture in two parts. One part is the uh, introduction of what is an ecosystem model, how do we model them and uh, what specific uh, challenges do we meet when we want to use data simulation in these models. And that is what I plan to do before the break. And then after the break, I will take you to a few published examples of how data simulation has been used in practice in different biogeochemical and ecosystem models. Uh, so first of all, we start with uh, what is an ecosystem? And we often think of only the biology when we talk about the ecosystem, but the ecosystem actually includes everything. It includes the environment and the organisms that live there. So a very small confined example of an ecosystem is the aquarium. Uh, if you run it well, you can actually, it can actually go and do everything by itself, but often you have to go in there and clean. Uh, and then the more messy type of ecosystem will be the Arctic Ocean, where you have everything from sea ice algae to polar bears to uh, humans that hunt and uh, yeah. And then in different ecosystems, you sometimes have a very diverse uh, ecosystem like the flower field is one example where you have many different species and they, they coexist uh, happily together in uh, their ecosystem is just one uh, species that completely takes over. So on your lawn, for example, there's only grass, mostly grass. And, uh, and when you see a dandelion, you take it away so you can show it's mostly grass. And uh, so you may think that it would be easier to model a lawn than a, a flower field, for example, because you have a simpler system. Um, so for the marine ecosystem in general, uh, I mean, if you think on land, there is a lack of water, but uh, there's enough water in the ocean. But what limits the plant growth in the ocean is uh, basically light or nutrients. So in polar regions, you get a lot of nutrients mixed up during the winter but light limits the production. But in the more Southern regions, you get a, a permanent stratification of the ocean. So then there's primarily nutrients that limit the production. And what's special in the ocean compared to land is that it's really these tiny one-celled organisms are making up 50% of the primary production in the, uh, in the world actually. Um, so they are uh, responsible for 50% of the production of oxygen, for example, these tiny one-celled organisms. But since they're one-celled organisms, they grow very fast. And that's uh, really, it makes the data simulation sometimes quite challenging in the, in, on these parts of the marine ecosystems. Uh, then the other main parts are, are zooplankton. And then zooplankton are eaten by fish and fish are eaten by uh, marine mammals or us or uh, seals, for example. And then there are decomposers like bacteria and sponges, for example, also decomposed material that uh, bring everything back into its basic elements. And then it can be taken up again by phytoplankton. And all these variable, all these uh, different species or groups of species are then uh, influenced by the environment in the ocean, such as temperature, salinities, sometimes, or they are uh, transported around, the plankton are transported around by currents and, uh, and fish and marine mammals also operate according to light. I mean, they sometimes are visual predators, so they need light to actually capture their prey and, uh, and the zooplankton then hide because they go down during the day to hide from predators. Uh, so the challenge that we have in the marine ecosystem models is that we don't have any uh, basic equations 
in the ocean modeling, we have, or atmospheric modeling, for example, we have the equations of motions. They're very complicated, but at least we have a set of equations. These are the ones we need to solve, uh, and we know that. Um, for ecosystem models, we need to define what those equations are. Um, so most of them are based around some kind of currency. Either, for example, you have to conserve energy in terms of biomass uh, or how much energy biomass includes, or for example, cycling of elements. And for the biochemical models that we are focusing on today, it's normally the cycling of elements that we uh, are focusing on. For example, in the climate models, you have uh, biochemical models that are very focused on the carbon cycle. So they use carbon as their basic uh, currency and track that through the model. Other times there are, for example, nitrate or nitrogen is often used as a, as a limiting nutrient and sometimes also phosphorus. Uh, so typic typically the elements that are the basic uh, building stones for organic matter can be used as elements. I just need to make this, no, okay. Um, and then, of course, the, there are so many uh, species uh, of, for example, plankton alone, there are thousands of species. So we need to do some kind of uh, simplification. And normally we group the species uh, by what, for example, what kind of elements they need to grow, uh, their function in the ecosystem, uh, different things, how fast they grow, uh, how large they are, for example, are different ways that we can group the species so that we get uh, the numerous species down to a manageable uh, number of groups that we can handle in the model that interact with each other. So that's often uh, referred to as functional types. So you can have a functional type model, but you also can have a size-based model, for example. And then we have different types. Uh, we have Eulerian models in uh, ecosystem models, and then we assume that the biomass of these different groups of uh, species or, or organisms can be treated uh, as a continuous variable so that we can apply all the operators such as gradient and, and uh, diffusion and things like that to these uh, variables. Then we have Lagrangian models and those are normally used for uh, larger species from zooplankton and up to fish. And then you follow either uh, individuals themselves or you follow a group of individuals and you say all these individuals have um, similar properties uh, and they grow in a similar way and we call those super individuals. But you can also have one for plankton. For example, people have used that to study light limitation in a mixing environment, how much light is the plankton exposed to over the period of the day. Um, and then they range from representing a single species. You can have a model for cod or you can have one uh, for the entire food web. So you can have a model for the Arctic Ocean. Um, and then box models are of course very coarse in their spatial uh, resolution. And we go, sometimes we represent only the water column for simplification. And other times we represent the full 3D ocean circulation model. And the examples that I'm showing today are mostly either water column model or full 3D ocean circulation model. And so the applications are of course for basic research. Uh, for marine predictions, we know that for example, in the CMAMS, we have many uh, predictions uh, or forecast systems that include, or all of them actually include biochemical variables, but only a few so far, or just one I think includes the uh, biogeochemical assimilation in the forecast. Uh, so that's under development, but we're working on that. And there's also uh, 
climate predictions. So I don't know if Francois showed you uh, anything for that, but I know that he uses uh, some uh, assimilation also, or is working on that. And then there's fisheries management, but it's basically these two, the marine prediction systems and the climate prediction systems that we'll focus on because that's where the data simulation applications have, have come the longest. Uh, and this is just an example of the Eulerian model. Uh, so if you look at the micro scale, of course, you cannot uh, say that this is a continuous variable because they're uh, discrete organisms. But as you zoom out and you go into the, the scale of the basin, you can see that uh, it more or less behaves like a fluid, even though it's quite patchy. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a good approximation when you go onto the, well, maybe, I don't know about 10 meter scale, but on 10 kilometer scale, you are good. Yes, yeah, so this is typically how it looks like. Uh, so you have a primary producer, you have something, so that's the P, the phytoplankton, that's what uh, takes up energy from the sun and, and produces biomass. And then you have something that eats that. And then uh, of course, something is eating the zooplankton again, but mostly when we uh, do biogeochemical models, for now, we, we cut out the fish. So we just, because uh, it's too complicated to model. Um, but both of these die and they, they go into uh, some dead organic material, which is then broken down by bacteria uh, back into the basic nutrients or the basic currency of the model. And some models include the bacteria explicitly, others keep it as just a parameterization. You can go more complicated. This is the model that we use uh, now presently for the bio, for the biogeochemical reanalysis and forecast at the Nansen Center. Uh, so you have then broken down, for example, the phytoplankton, you have broken it down in two groups and the zooplankton in three groups. Um, and the nutrients, we are broken it down in several groups. So that's how you uh, make it more complex, but that also means that you add a lot more parameters to the system. And then I, this, this one is the, is the most complex that we have, it's RSM. Uh, no, it's not the most complex, it's one of the most complex ones. And, and here, in addition to the groups that they have that are similar to us, they track several different uh, elements. So for example, for each phytoplankton, they track five different elements. So that means that there are five, uh, five more parameters for each, uh, each group. So that becomes quite complex then. Um, so this is basically, I mean, it's basically just a, a tracer on the physical side. It's basically just a change of the tracer concentration, the tracer advection. And then uh, some of these variables have sinking velocities, such as the particulate organic matter will have a sinking velocity, some diffusion, and then the biological terms. There are those that typically take up the temperature, salinity, light, um, and maybe other environmental variables. And typically they're quite sensitive to which physical model you're coupling them to because uh, it's, it, for example, vertical velocity can be quite different in different uh, physical ocean models. And we don't know it well. So this is the very simplest one I could find. Uh, it was just two variables, just the phytoplankton and a herbivore, one that eats the phytoplankton. So it looks quite simple, but what makes it a little bit more complicated is of course that the the term on the right here is depending on H because uh, G is a function of H and then the same here, this uh, growth of the herbivore is a function of P. So it then becomes a little, I mean, it's quite simple, but a little bit more complicated because they're interconnected. And I think this is typically the kind of uh, models that the theoretical data simulation like to play with. And then if you go into the four component one, it becomes a little bit more uh, complex. 
And then I'm not going to show anything more than this because this already has a lot of parameters. And then for the data simulation, we need the observations as well. So for ocean models, we typically use, we can use laboratory and mesocosm um, experiments, but those typically used for formulating the model itself or, or selecting a reasonable range of parameter initially. Uh, we don't use them for validation because there are conditions in mesocosm and I mean, mesocosm is closer, but it's, it isn't like the open ocean. So uh, basically to inform the model, how does the system work? Uh, these are very useful. Um, then uh, ship-based uh, observations are very good, but they're time consuming. And um, often, for example, for nitrate that I show here, they have to be taken back to the lab and analyzed. And so that means that uh, it cannot be used for the forecast system, for example, because we don't know uh, until a while later. But there are now autonomous uh, nitrate sensors being used. So that's uh, very good. Um, we have time series stations, for example, outside Norway, we have station M, which we have used in many studies, which has very good uh, resolution of uh, nutrients and chlorophyll uh, from the model. So chlorophyll is... Uh, component of the phytoplankton, which is very easily observed. So it's often, it's the most often used assimilated variable in the biogeochemical models. It's, based, it's what they need to, to do photosynthesis in color. So it can be detected with instruments and also from space. Then you have autonomous observations such as uh, bioargo and floats, which are becoming more and more uh, available also for biogeochemical uh, variables. So that's really good. And of course, then you have remote sensing, which is basically mostly ocean color. I've seen a couple of publications on phytoplankton biomass from LIDAR, but it hasn't really taken off uh, as I see it. It's not, I have never seen an assimilation study using that. So basically, from ships, we get. Um, nutrients, we can get carbon chemistry and, uh, and chlorophyll. Uh, and primary production, we can get, but it's basically, uh, you have to do an onboard incubation to estimate the primary production. So we, we don't have many observations. The same is uh, for grazing rates. We don't have many observations. Um, and so that's slow uh, work intensive uh, measurements. And uh, we have a few time series around the ocean, such as bats uh, and a station outside, uh, outside England that's maintained by the Plymouth Marine Laboratory that are, are very well observed. So that's also very useful. Uh, the other thing is that, for example, in the Norwegian Sea, we have a lot of nutrients, but the uh, collection is really designed after how the fish, uh, the fish biomass moves. So we have a lot of uh, observations in the spring in the early part of the year. And then we have a lot of observations in the fall in the late part of the year. And so if you assimilate that, that will of course uh, affect how the model, uh, how good your models are in different regions and different times. So these are just uh, examples of autonomous measurements. The most common one, I guess is BioArgo. Uh, which are being deployed uh, quite a lot. And uh, you can see here some distribution of bioargo. And then I added this a nice example of uh, an uh, ice tether profiler that was, um, was deployed in the Arctic for, for several months or more than a year, I guess. And, and so it collected uh, it has a wire and the, the instrument is crawling on the wire. So you get profiles of different uh, variables, biochemical variables under the sea ice. And I think that's maybe the, the best time series or the best kind of Lagrangian type time series that we have for variables under the sea ice because we hardly have any observations there. So more of that would be good. So remote sensing 
has a very nice spatial resolution, especially on a cloud-free day, but it can only see uh, the surface ocean. So uh, the ocean color can actually see, uh, we say that it can see like one optical depth, which is you know, maybe 10, more than 10 meters, but it doesn't see, for example, a deep chlorophyll maximum that sometimes can exist at 50 or 70 meters depth. So, what? So in relation to the model, there are more observations of these uh, state variables, the uh, phytoplankton and nutrients, not so many of zooplankton or detritus, but more of these uh, than these rates. So we know what the state variables are, but we don't know, really know what the rates are uh, always. And, and then the more complex these models become, we may have observations of five or three variables, but the model has 50. So we don't really know, uh, can, can this constrain other parts of the model? Uh, when we have these observations and, and those are things, it's things that we are actually looking at in the EU project right now, but these are really many open questions in assimilation of biochemical models that we'll, we still need to look at. And then, of course, when you look at assimilation, you need to consider the sources of uncertainty. So. Basically the atmospheric forcing, of course, especially light. Um, since we don't have many observations, initial conditions are also uh, not always well known. We normally just use climatology, but uh, some places there are not many observations being the base of this climatology. Um, and then there of course are errors in the physical model, such as transport mixing and upwelling. And we never know, you can never validate the vertical velocity in a, in a physical model, but it will actually have a quite a big uh, impact on the results of the biochemical model because it impacts the upwelling of nutrients, how much nutrients are available for phytoplankton. And therefore, you sometimes get very different results between uh, different uh, physical models. And then of course we are making up, or it must making up, but we don't have a basic equation. So uh, the model formulation may be inaccurate and we don't know all the parameters. So those are typically the big sources of uncertainty. Um, and then for data simulation, this plot is from Alan et al, 2010. And I think it nicely uh, illustrates the data simulation. So you have an observation uh, which is somehow away from the truth. And then you have the prediction, which is the model, and then you try to combine the two. But I, you have had much better introductions to data assimilation this week, I think, uh, than what I give now, but just a reminder. Um, and then for the most part, uh, for example, in the operational oceanography, we use uh, data simulation to improve the state estimation and, and also constrain the initial conditions for the forecast. Uh, there are many studies that use data simulation for parameter estimation. So I'm gonna show you some examples after. And you can also do joint state parameter estimation. Um, and then I'm gonna also show you later an example where it tries to use the data simulation to give um, some information of what's the, what's the optimal model. Do we really need very complex model to represent the system or can we use simpler models? Other things to consider is that uh, the, it's, these models are quite computationally demanding. So for example, if you wanna use the ensemble Kalman filter uh, that we use in our physical model to uh, do the forecast, uh, we normally do, use a coarser model for the biochemical assimilation because it takes more time to uh, advect all these tracers. So if you have a model of medium complexity, which is normally like 14 variables, you have to uh, advect 14 tracers. And if you have 50 variables, you have to advect 
50 tracer, and this is something that takes quite a bit of time in the in the model. So when uh, there are options, of course, you can use a coarser physical model like we do. Uh, there's also examples, not in operational oceanography, but others where they use an uh, emulator. Um, or sometimes uh, in some studies for investigation, we use just a water column model because uh, there, of course, advection is important in the ocean, but the main variability in the biology is really in the vertical. So you can run uh, a water column model by itself and investigate a lot of parameter estimation and uh, how the data simulation method works in a 1D water column. Yeah. So I think I said this, we don't always know the model for formulation. Uh, one thing to think about when, when you want to use data simulation is in the biochemical model is that we cannot have negative uh, variables. Uh, I guess it's the same thing for salinity in the ocean model, but salinity is normally so far away from zero that it's not a problem. But the nutrients, for example, they go down to zero. And if they go below zero, it will typically just blow up your model completely. So you have to respect that matter uh, cannot, uh, cannot become negative, at least here on Earth. And... Um, you also need to uh, take care that mass does not uh, disappear because it cannot appear or disappear. So of course, uh, sometimes you can accept that it's not 100% conservative because you have rivers going out, you have dead material being buried, but you cannot have a huge uh, source of sink somewhere. And then of course your parameters should be biologically sound, you cannot have a huge mortality, for example, on a fish stock or a zooplankton population, because then they, that's, that's not biologically uh, correct. So you need to have something that's uh, more or less realistic. Uh, so variables are non-Gaussian distributed often, for example, chlorophyll um, it has many, many uh, values that are very low, and then they have just a few that are very high. So, uh, and I think uh, Loda has told you about uh, anam anamorphosis uh, transformations earlier, and we often often use that in the assimilation techniques for biochemical models. So uh, just to illustrate that, for example, here, uh, Ewan and Lara, they used a very, very simple, I think it's just a three, uh, three component ecosystem model. So it has just phytoplankton, zooplankton and detritus. And they uh, do a twin experiment and they try to regain uh, the parameter uh, in this twin experiment. Uh, and here they are not using uh, the anamorphosis. Uh, so uh, on this red part, they cannot uh, recover the parameter that they uh, originally set. And then here, when they use the anamorphosis, they, they can recover. So it's, you, you see that it actually works. Uh, it actually improves the process. And then we have this uncertainty in the model parameters. We don't know them very well. Most of them are really not observed. Um, but, and then we, we can, of course, uh, we can estimate them with bio, with the uh, data simulation, but, uh, if you estimate them too strongly, that may also lead to the model being overfitted. Uh, and we don't always know what's the optimal, uh, set of parameters because there can be local minimums or global minimums, you don't know if you reach that, if you try to optimize. Uh, so to do this properly, you, you need both this knowledge of the data simulation and those techniques, but you also uh, need the knowledge of the ecosystem model that you, ecosystem that you're trying to model. And yeah, we talked about observations. Um, 
So we don't have many. Um, and when we estimate the model parameters, if we have just one uh, state parameter uh, that to assimilate, it's difficult to estimate 15 models parameters. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example later where they have uh, optimized several several models of different complexity. And you see how that goes. Um, yeah, then for the observational error, of course, you need to define that uh, when you set up the assimilation system. Um, and then it's, this is becoming more known. So for example, for the uh, ocean color from space, you can get uh, the observational error with the product. But sometimes for other observations, you have to make guesses. Uh, about uh, what the good, what's a good observational error to use. And then, of course, for the model, you need to, if you want to use the ensemble-based uh, data simulation techniques, you need to create an ensemble, and you have to um, have to decide what you want to perturb in the model, uh, and there are different strategies. Uh, of course, we can learn from what they've done in the physical data simulation, but it doesn't always create a, a spread in the biogeochemistry. Um, so here is one example where we have a late occurring spring bloom in our model system. And uh, the blue blue line, no, the yeah, the blue line is the model, and it doesn't, it really wants to bloom late. This is a problem we've been having for years. And um, uh, in the observation, the bloom has started. But since none of the uh, ensembles in this run is blooming, there is no way that we can, uh, we can uh, get the model to be, get this data to be assimilated because there's actually no spread in the, in the model. Um, and so there, here we have to, this is actually a current problem we have. So we have to be more inventive in the way that we, uh, perturb the model. And then, of course, there are uh, these blooms. They happen very quickly, and then they decay very quickly. So if you have a small uh, difference in the timing of the model, then you can have uh, very large errors. They actually don't look that bad uh, if you plot, plot them together. But uh, if you look at actual errors, they're quite large. And, and here is one example. Uh, where uh, you see here uh, these, I mean, these two green lines, they look quite similar, but when you look at the errors, they're very large. And so if you try to assimilate uh, here, um, it's very difficult. But then, so this in this publication, he was uh, testing different models to kind of uh, phase shift uh, the, the time series so that they became more uh, more in tune, and then you can have smaller errors. Uh, so you can kind of take away, take away this timing error a little bit because it's not, it's not, it looks bigger than it actually is. Um, so I'm attending, I'm approaching the end uh, of this one. So I'm just having, uh, I guess, this short summary that you can maybe read. Yeah, so I think I've said all of this. Uh, so I'll just end here. And uh, so we have a five minute break now. So I will be here if you want to ask questions. And if, but if you want to go and get a coffee or have a small break or move around a little bit, that's also perfectly fine, of course. Thanks. Uh, we have some questions in the, in the list. Oh, I can read okay. it to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one from Edson Silva that about yeah. the frequency at which you assimilate the, those chloro R, RS chlorophyll. I don't know the name, sorry. Yeah, every uh, sensing. Uh, yeah. Yes, normally weekly. Okay. Yeah. So, so it, I mean, we could have we could have done it more. It's for practical reasons. Uh, I'm going to show you some results later. Is that these phytoplankton, they grow really fast. So sometimes when we assimilate uh, the model, for example, if the phytoplankton is too large, they, 
assimilation draws it down, but the, but the model still wants to bloom. So in the cycle, it increases again, and then the assimilation draws it down. So you get this seesaw uh, pattern, actually. So I yeah. think maybe, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is there more questions or? Yes, uh, I have two more. Um, so one thing is about uncertainty in the model uh, formulation, actually, is so you, you can have uh, parameters in the model that's wrong, and you know you can perturb these parameters in your ensemble to account for these uncertainties. But what if your whole process is wrong in the model formulation? How do you account for such kind of uncertainty in ensemble so that you represented this uncertainty? I don't know. Uh, that's very difficult. I mean, yeah. you, you have to kind of assume that your, your basic description of the system is right. It's right, yeah. Yeah, otherwise you have to is... assume that. Otherwise, you have to go back and reformulate yeah. the model, I think. Because, uh, but I mean, we know that if we put the bottle of water somewhere with some nutrients, there are going to be some phytoplankton. We know this this happens. We don't know exactly which phytoplankton is going to be there, but we know something's going to grow there if you make the conditions right. So it's, yeah, I think you have to just assume that your basic yeah. description or your very kind of uh, overall description of the system is, is a good description. Let's say that the model doesn't do uh, that doesn't bloom at all. Like all the model has a, a error formulation, so that they don't want to bloom. Uh, is there a way like you can inject some energy in so that you're constantly adding some uh, species concentration at random time so that they actually does something? So it's like a poor man's fix to the problem. Yeah, we actually did something. Similar, we, we are during winter to avoid the biomass for becoming too long, we are too low. We are kind of turning off all uh, loss sources, all grazing or mortality when the phytoplankton uh, reach a certain level. Uh, and that makes the model bloom a little earlier. Uh, so there's something like that. And there is uh, proposed mechanisms that you know, the phytoplankton have to have some kind of seed population during winter. So there are proposed mechanisms for how they have these seed populations. So it's somewhat, it's not all way out there biologically to have a small uh, phytoplankton biomass available. But um, for the moment we are thinking about maybe it's the physical model. So we need, it's not really the biological model as a problem, it's a physical model. So maybe we need to fix uh, some of the, for example, mixing, uh, yes. you need to have a certain stratification before you can start the bloom. So if the model doesn't create this stratification early enough, you're going to get always this delay in the bloom. Mm. So it could I be this, forcing. Yeah. yeah. This is a quite challenging problem. If you have all collapsed ensemble in the other components, for example, the forcing, and then that maybe leads to this kind of delayed behavior. And you need to know the physics to trace up uh, what's the root cause of, of, the, of this issue and solve the problem uh, there, I guess. Yeah. And then it's, if it's mixing, it's not, it's not the easiest problem uh, in the ocean modeling. It's uh, quite challenging, so. Uh, new Question from Matt Lee. Uh, how nonlinear are the biomodels uh, that you are using, assuming the ocean and atmosphere forcings are stationary? So, how, how... What, what about the, uh, the nonlinearity occurred in the dynamics of the biomodel itself? Yeah, there are nonlinear there are nonlinear uh, interactions between the between the variables. It depends, of course, on the how you set up the models, but normally these kind of uh, functions that we use for interaction, for example, grazing and um, yeah, mortality, some uh, mortality mostly linear, but grazing nutrient uptake, these are, are not linear functions. And so the, and there's also interactions between them. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can get these, uh, you can get chaotic behavior in, in, yeah. in this model, do, if you like I to, yeah. 
Yeah, I do remember seeing some video on uh, uh, predator prey population modeling. And if you set the correct parameter, they are like growing up and down, even though yeah. the, the environment parameters are fixed. Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah, you can get the, what they, I think they call like cycles, predator prey cycles, uh, but we don't see this much in nature, you know, so mm -hmm. it's more a property of the mathematical system than, uh, than it is. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really yeah, in real. Nature, it's more complex sometimes to, to yeah. uh, you, and they're more forced systems in, in the nature too. Yeah. Okay, I think we have addressed all the questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I, uh, I want to remind everyone that you can also uh, put uh, raise your hand if you want to talk about your question. So it's, it's okay, don't be shy. And if you want yeah. to write it down, then you can either write it down in the chat box here or in the document. Uh, okay, Great. I'll let you continue if you want. Yeah, then I will continue. Um, yeah, so here I have. I will just make a big one. I've collected some examples of applications of data simulation in ecosystem models, and uh, they're mostly biogeochemical models that we are, are looking at. Um, what? So f the first ones are on state estimation, so it's about obtaining the best state, for example, for the reanalysis or forecast or initial conditions. Um, and so the first example I'm going to show you is from uh, Shiavata et al. 2016. And then there's one from our group, Simon et al. 2015. And the first one is from this uh, ERSAM model, uh, which is the one used by PML. Um, and they have constructed a uh, decadal reanalysis uh, using, uh, by assimilating ocean color. And for this one, um, they used an ensemble of 100 members using the ensemble Kalman filter, and uh, they perturbed the model by uh, perturbing the underwater light field. Um, So here you can see some results. Um, so you see that there are, uh, see one of the things that we have is that this, this is quite patchy and it's moving around. So you have some areas where the analysis is better than uh, than the reference, but you also have some areas where it's worse. And you can also see that it's quite patchy. If you remember the picture I showed you before and then the Regency and the Eddies, we get these kind of, uh, these kind of patterns and uh, they're not so easy to uh, reproduce for the physical model. Uh, but then you see that, uh, for example, temperature is very good. Uh, dissolved oxygen is quite good. Salinity, is, is a little bit more challenging to model because it has these land sources and, and we don't have observation, so many observations. Uh, and chlorophyll that's actually being uh, assimilated, it still has quite a uh, high spread in the model. So we have normally, this is, this is quite normal. We have quite good representation of the nutrients in the model. Uh, chlorophyll is, is patchy and it grows and decays fast and so it's difficult to model. So even after assimilation, uh, there is quite a big spread uh, when you plot the observations against the model. Uh, so, but this, this is done then uh, without uh, just state estimation. Uh, there's no parameters being estimated here, but it, it's, a, it's a nice study. Mm, and then, Ewan, uh, before Simon et al. 2015, he made a pilot reanalysis, which I guess we, we are about to uh, replace this pilot reanalysis, but it's a joint parameter state estimation study. And uh, also in this study, we assimilated uh, chlorophyll, uh, but we also assimilated the physical uh, variables that we normally do, like temperature and salinity and SSH. Um, 
and we chose eight parameters. No, we chose four, four parameters that we, uh, yes, four, sorry, that we uh, estimated. And they were allowed to vary freely in space and time. So we gave the model very free reigns and we didn't also, we didn't uh, restrict uh, the, we didn't restrict the range that we gave it. Um, and so using this method, we produced a four-year reanalysis. Um, and here I show you what, yeah, what I showed, I uh, told about before about these seesaw patterns. So uh, here you see we are assimilating the chlorophyll every week, and we are estimating four parameters. So the phytoplankton mortality and zooplankton mortality. And, and the reason why we chose mortality was that we don't know what that is. It's very, uh, it's kind of just sticking your finger in the air and saying, okay, let's say 10%. Uh, and then we use that. So and they're very uncertain. But we are uh, assimilating chlorophyll weekly and the model really wants to bloom. So uh, it gets drawn down by the, uh, uh, by the assimilation. But then as soon as you let the model go again, and it goes back up. And so uh, then you get these seesaw patterns that you see here. And then, of course, since we let these parameters loose, we get a very, uh, very big variability of the parameters over the basin, uh, so that the model always tries to fit, uh, fit what's going on in the observations. Um, but then, finally, we took all these parameters and we uh, collected them by uh, by regions that we think have similar um, biogeochemical properties. And so you see that you can get some kind of annual cycle of the parameters. And I actually tried once to rerun the model, taking out some of these time series in the in the place. And it, it, you do actually get better. Uh, you do actually get a better uh, estimate using these time varying parameters. So it, that could be a development to go for. Um, then there are some more results. And uh, here uh, I showed 2007 because at that time we only assimilated physics. Uh, so we see that we have in the, there are some changes. We have uh, maybe a little bit earlier bloom, which is nice, uh, uh, but uh, we don't have that much effect on the chlorophyll overall. And then in 2008, we assimilated both physics and chlorophyll, and uh, we have a much better fit between the data and the assimilated run. Um, and also we looked at nutrients, which we did not assimilate, and those are not very much affected, which uh, we know they're not necessarily better, but of course, fortunately, they're not necessarily worse either, which could also happen. So, here, the variables were able were um, were allowed to vary in space and time, and we didn't uh, we didn't restrict them. Uh, and so, in some places in the southern region, which is model is not really set up for, uh, these parameters actually went far outside what's really biologically good. So we have to also say that that uh, it's nice to have free parameters, but not. Uh, may be the best always. So and now we're working on a new, um, a new uh, reanalysis. And uh, we were a little bit more restrictive on the parameters uh, this time. Uh, we chose a few more. So we use eight parameters this time. Um, but we have, uh, we have given them limits. Uh, so they cannot go outside what's really biolog we think is biologically sound. Uh, and in addition, they're not spatially varying anymore. Uh, so that means that when the bloom starts in the south, it can also uh, adjust parameters in the north, uh, which is, yeah, we're looking into it. It's we, we needed to make some decisions. So for the, for the time, time being, they are spatially uh, uniform. Um, and in addition, we have, uh, an, uh, we have used another uh, uh, assimilation method, which uh, was developed by Muha, which will give the presentation after me. So uh, 
then we are first uh, in the first step we're estimating the parameters and then there's a second step where we estimate uh, use these estimate the parameters and estimate the step. And so it's a little more expensive, but it turns out it works uh, better for biochemical models. And we are, we are simulating nutrients. So, um, so you can see here, we have uh, the free run where we have a mismatch between the uh, model and observations and then uh, for the for the reanalysis it, it is now much better this is for the barency um, and for nutrients we also have a small improvement but we're not really sure whether it is the nutrient observations because they're not that many so we don't know really how much impact they have we have to look more closely into that or if it is the improvement of the bloom dynamics that are really improving the nutrients. This is something we still need to look into because this is, this is ongoing work. Yeah, so I just want to make the point that for the, for the complex models or, or for any model really, we can constrain some parameters, but we don't really know if we are doing, uh, if it's, we cannot constrain all of them um, because we have fewer observations than we have uh, than we have. Uh, I lost the word. We have fewer observations than we have uh, the variables in the model, so we only observe a few. Um, so for the parameters, it's one something to think about how to pick them. And for, uh, for the, first of all, you may wanna do a sensitivity analysis on a simple, on the simplified model to see uh, which parameter the model is, uh, is sensitive to. For example, in our case, we also use the parameter to parameter uh, ensemble uh, or the parameter perturbation to create the ensemble. So if you don't use anything that the model is uh, sensitive to it, you won't also have any spread. Um, and then you may wanna look at how well the, the values are known. For example, for nutrient uptake, there are a number of uh, biological experiments that have measured this. So, so maybe you know that better than for example, mortality that we chose in the first reanalysis. Uh, and if you choose too many or you're too strict, you may overfit the model and it may not work very well uh, some places. It may work very well some places, but not so well the other places. And you have connected parameters. So if you, for example, in the model, if you increase the growth rate, it may have the exact same effect on the model as uh, increasing, decreasing the mortality. So the models, uh, if you choose to uh, estimate both of these parameters, the model may not really know which parameter to decide on what to estimate because they have the canceling effect on each other. And uh, yeah, so I mentioned before estimation of uh, time dependent uh, parameters. So you may think that the, uh, the for example, the community of phytoplankton will uh, will change over the season. So it may be appropriate to have different growth rates, for example, over the season or different uh, chlorophyll to nitrate ratio. And so this is what this study by Macron et al. 2012 is about. Uh, it's about uh, estimating some regionally varying parameter for a region outside Canada. And they did a sensitivity study and they picked the two most sensitive parameters that they, uh, they uh, estimated. And because, as I said before, the model are quite heavy, they used an emulator approach. So they, they uh, generated an emulator for the model. Uh, so that's kind of a simplified version of the model that can be either a statistical model or a dynamical model. And it's 
of course fitted from the model and then in their approach they use something called polynomial chaos expansion I think you cannot ask me the details about this but that's what they use and so um, they <laughs> use this emulator to get this uh, very uh, crazy pot where everything is uh, seems quite random. And uh, so you have on this uh, X axis, you have the maximum chlorophyll to carbon ratio. That's how much uh, uh, chlorophyll the phytoplankton have in their uh, inside. So how eff efficiently they can use, uh, they can do uh, photosynthesis. And then the second one, was the zooplankton grazing parameters. Uh, and, but so they did some smoothing, uh, some intense smoothing. And finally, they actually regained some kind of annual cycle uh, path of these two parameters. And then they ran the model again with the parameters. And so you have, um, have this red line here, which the up is the optimal parameters that are fixed in time, so no time varying. Then you have the green one, uh, which are the time varying parameter run. And then you have the blue one, which is the emulator experiment, which is rich of course fitted. So that's the one that performs best. But you see that the performance of the, the green, uh, and there's errors on the side here, the performance on the green line, the time wearing is, is much better. So, so I think there is a case for maybe not making the model more complex, but maybe allowing uh, parameters to vary in, in time and data simulation can help you decide how they should vary in time. Uh, there's another example on the complexity. So, so this, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna skip that. So this is a quite old study or in 2007. So uh, Friedrich et al, they compared 12 different models. Uh, um, and uh, this time we are working with a uh, one, uh, 1D ecosystem, but they have 12 different models of different complexity that they taste, test in two different locations. So in the Pacific Ocean and in the Indian Ocean. And, and though all these models were just authored by different people and just uh, sent to, uh, to her to uh, do this in the comparison study. So you start out with uh, um, how these models perform out of the box. And, uh, and then on the x-axis this time, there is increasing complexity. So we have very simple models on the, on the left and then very complex models on the right. And you can see the errors, red for Pacific, blue for Arabian Sea in the different basin. So you see, uh, for at least for the Pacific, the errors are quite large for the simple models. So then what they did was that they optimized each model at each location. So what you see now is that um, the simple models, they really perform uh, just as well as the, as the complex models. And so the next thing they did was then to swap so that they are now taking the model that's optimized in the Pacific and running it in the Arabian Sea and vice versa. And what, what emerges now is that for, for the complex models overall, they really perform much better um, on this, uh, uh, on the second site where they were not optimized for, while the more simple model, they're not able to perform very well uh, at the site that they're not optimized for. So, so what you may wanna take away from that is that if you wanna just uh, model simple, very small region, uh, you may as well be okay with the, just a very uh, four to six component model uh, that represents the very basic properties, but if you want to model the global ocean or if you want to do a climate model, then you probably want to go to a more complex model that has more uh, types of uh, phytoplankton and more complexity represented. Yeah, that was that was the conclusion I said before <laughs> showing the conclusion slide. Um, then I have a third uh, example here 
from Word in all 2013. Uh, and they um, actually took a, a single ecosystem model and then they, uh, so this is this one, uh, this, it's not very complex to begin with, but uh, they took this model and then they systematically remove processes and they compare it to a data set that they have and they see how well uh, is the model representing this data set and, and how many uh, parameters or process can we actually take out from this model and still represent the system that we're having. And so here uh, is the result uh, summarized and this AIC and BIC, I've, re I've written in the, in the notes what they are, but uh, they basically are an app. They're all measures of uh, fit to the model and it, it balances it balances the fit of the model to how simplified the model is. So there is some uh, there's some score also for being simple. Uh, and it turns out that um, at one station, they could actually remove 14 of the parameters and still represent the system very well. At this other station, this neighbor, they could remove 11 parameters and still represent the system fairly well. So. Uh, that's also another way that you can use uh, data simulation for optimization. And you can see whether you have actually over, over parameterized your model. So I, I added uh, references for all of this at the end of the presentation. So if you want to go and look more closely, you can do that. Um, then finally, I want to just uh, include a couple of studies um, that use these new autonomous observations. Uh, one uses Argo floats and the other uses Glider because these are, are really coming. And so I think it, this will be more and more used in the future, uh, the assimilation of these autonomous uh, instruments. So this is kind of the weather balloons of the ocean. And when we start to get them, for the biochemical uh, observations, that's very good. So the first uh, example, we are going back to the PML group again and the ERSA model. And so they have a recent paper on multi-platform assimilation in the North Sea. And they assimilate two kinds of observations. They assimilate, uh, well, they assimilate just chlorophyll but they're simulating the ocean color from, from satellite. And they're also uh, assimilating observations from a glider that is on the, well, kind of north of the English channel is the location of this glider. So uh, what I'm showing here is basically the free run uh, minus the glider. So uh, you can see that there's quite a few errors so you have here Here's the spring bloom. So you can see this model also has some uh, troubles with putting the spring bloom in the, in the right time. And you can also see that the model does not uh, reproduce this deep chlorophyll maximum that we sometimes see develop over the season. At this big, uh, uh, yeah. And then they are, oh, no, there's, they're simulating the ocean color uh, chlorophyll from satellite. Uh, so we see that now the, the initiation of the bloom uh, improves a lot, the surface values improves a lot, but the, um, the deeper value, the deep chlorophyll maximum is still not represented. And then uh, you see that uh, when you include the glider, uh, the representation of the deep chlorophyll maximum becomes much better. And, and then, of course, when you assimilate both, it's the best. And, and it is compared to the glider, so it's no wonder it is becoming better. But, but of course, uh, the glider has a big uh, challenge is that it cannot be everywhere at once. So the, the, the chlorophyll, uh, surface chlorophyll from a satellite, of course, has a much better spatial resolution. But we do see the importance of having this deep information uh, in order to get the deeper parts of the ecosystem better represented. Uh, then there's a second uh, second study is quite similar. Uh, they do not use ANCAF, they use uh, 3D VAR, 
Um, and in the Mediterranean Sea, they are lucky enough that they have quite a few uh, biochemical argos. So they are quite advanced of all of us on the assimilation of this type of data. And this is a BGC discussions paper. Um, so they have some floats that uh, uh, measures chlorophyll, some have uh, nitrate sensors, uh, and some have oxygen. Um, and here is a basic result. So um, uh, the pink one is when you assimilate uh, chlorophyll only. Yeah, the black one is the reference, the free run, and then it's for assimilating uh, chlorophyll from satellite only. Um, then there is the green one is the float, uh, chlorophyll only, uh, and chlorophyll and nitrate. So you can see when you assimilate the float, it, uh, it reduces the error quite a bit um, in both regions. So, so these regions over here on the west side are very low produ uh, productivity regions. So they also have quite low uh, errors. Um, but when you assimilate uh, chlorophyll from, from the satellite as well, you actually get uh, and of course, this is compared to the uh, Argo floats themselves. But when you assimilate chlorophyll uh, from the surface, also you actually increase the RMSD. So one challenge that we have when we assimilate both of these is that uh, at the surface, uh, the algorithm for, that uh, produces chlorophyll uh, based on the ocean color may not give you the same uh, value as the uh, as the float gives you. So there's, uh, there's errors in both uh, observ observations. And then you have to really decide which one do you want to trust the more, which one do you want to give a big, um, big uh, observational error. And, and in this study, they suggest that maybe you, you should give the satellite a bigger um, observational error when it is close to the floats uh, so that you don't get these inconsistencies between the different data types. So uh, we come to the summary. Um, I think uh, this just summarizes everything I've said. Um, and yeah, I can just open for questions uh, and you can read this on your own. Okay, great. Thank you, Annette, for this very informative uh, contents. Um, I have one question. I see. I see. Laurence are answering questions for you on the on the document. One. Oh, okay. Answer. Thanks. <laughs> uh, one thing is uh, when you mentioned that you're going to uh, estimate parameters that it varies in time. I was yeah. wondering if you can also do that in space, so the parameters can also vary uh, spatially. Yes. Yeah, so we did that for the for the reanalysis that we made before. We had this four year pilot reanalysis. Then we we also let the parameters vary in space. But yeah, it, it's really it's really not we don't have a good clear answer on what is best because you can't uh, you can't let them really loose, but then you get a very complex uh, answer back. So it's really, yeah, I think sometimes we were thinking about maybe making them temporarily, uh, we could make them temporarily dependent. I guess you could also make them latitudinally dependent or uh, maybe make some kind of, uh, you know, what was it called if you, uh, yeah, so make a function where we do like a wavelet function or something that when you have, uh, a fewer parameters deciding how it varies in time than having a full data set, you know, for example, a sinusoidal function, a sum of sinusoidal functions or something could also be, uh, we were playing around with these ideas, but for the time being, we're just making uh, uh, some change in space and not in time. But uh, yeah, I think at some point we're going to end up on something that's uh, in between. Uh, but you can make it as complex as you want, of course, yeah. but you get that complex answer back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other question, uh, are you going to share the slides uh, somewhere? Yes, yes. Yeah. Is there, okay. I guess there is somewhere. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I, I made think, the PDF. Uh, can, 
yes can yeah make a i made a pdf of, uh, including uh, notes below on some of them so i will share those are there any more questions from the audience uh, we have about four minutes left before the coffee break doesn't appear so and no one's typing it in the okay open. so i think everything is clear that yeah you presented. thanks for listening yeah, yeah. i don't think yeah. so there's still a lot of work to be done here so i hope somebody will will be inspired yeah. i'll post the link uh, of the online documents again uh, uh, and th thank you all for listening uh, we'll take the coffee break and let's rejoin uh, 2.30 p.m. Yeah.